thermodynamics, heat engines, and entropy. Notice that uh, just a, a chunk of fuel is being lit by a match, and that chunk of that uh, flame that's burning here will start to heat up the water, and then that water will expand into a gas, and then that gas will be driven down here into a chamber that drives a piston. So let me pause and let's look at that again. So again, the gas that uh, is from the water vapor is being driven down, and when it's driven down, it will drive this piston. The expanding gas drives the piston down, does work, and when the piston gets down to the bottom, it switches over uh, a mechanism here that then allows the uh, gas to be driven out, the uh, cooled gas to be driven out, and then uh, reconnects another point to allow the uh, more expanding hot air to drive the piston again. So this piston is being driven down by hot gas, and then it's exhausting the cool gas, being driven down by hot gas, exhausting the cool gas, and uh, as it's going back and forth, being driven and being exhaust and exhausting the cool gas, then um, it's doing work. It's driving this wheel around. And this is a form of a heat engine known as a steam engine. This is just a very uh, unique one because it's made entirely out of glass, which is incredible. There are uh, uh, no fittings or anything. This is all completely made of, out of glass. It's a beautiful piece of artwork and machinery. But look at that work being done by the hot gas coming in and the coal gas being driven out of these uh, chambers and driven through, the, through this piston system. So let's take a look at uh, what was going on with that steam engine from a physics point of view. And we're going to start off with our ideal gas law. PV equals nRT. P is pressure, V is volume, N is the number of molecules, and R is a gas constant. These two things remain pretty much the same for what we're talking about. And T is temperature. So really, pressure, volume, and temperature are the things that we're looking at here. So as the temperature rose, as the uh, steam, uh, the water was boiled and the steam was created, the temperature rose, the uh, pressure rose, and that increased the uh, volume, the uh, gas started to expand. And when the gas started to expand, the piston is driven and work is being done. A force is being uh, applied, a force is being applied through a distance, and this piston is being driven. Uh, without work. So there's an equivalent with work with force and distance and pressure and a changing volume as the volume is expanding and doing work. If you can look at this derivation here, force times distance is pressure times the area of the piston times the distance that the piston is driven. That's the volume. So pressure times a change in volume does equal work. And that's what was happening here with our expanding gas doing work when the pressure created a change in volume. So what we just saw was what we would call, in, in essence, a, a heat engine. And so, in other words, we had a, a heat source, uh, the flame and the uh, water boiling creating gas. And that heat source, uh, through the gas expanding in the piston system, did mechanical work driving that flywheel as the piston was being driven. And then when it exhausted, uh, the exhaust came out with a cooler uh, steam than it went in. And uh, so we did lose some energy because that gas had to cool down. We had to exhaust it in order for us to have the piston draw back into uh, the, the cylinder. And so we had to expel some energy that we just couldn't use in, in our system. So these are the losses, kind of like the uh, non-conservative work that's done. Uh, these are the losses in the system. So we have our total energy going in. We get some useful work, the turning happening, and then we get losses in our system. And so any engine that's doing work for us that's useful has a particular efficiency and that efficiency is always going to be less than 100% or less than 1. Uh, 
And we can find that efficiency by taking the amount of work that we get out and dividing it by the amount of energy we put in, this heat energy. And that's a simple, the simplest way to explain a heat engine. Don't get too nervous about uh, heat engines. They're really pretty simple to calculate uh, information from. Here's our, our uh, heat engine. Uh, and we're going to put in 12,000 joules of uh, high heat energy. And the piston is then driven by that steam created by this heat. Piston is driven, and we'd get 5,000 joules of work out. Uh, and we want to know what is the heat output, the heat that comes out of the system and cools so we can condense the water to create more steam. This is our output energy, I'm mean, sorry, output heat, QL. So we have our heat en engine equation. The high heat is equal to the work plus the low heat output. And so in this case, we want to solve for QL, so we have to subtract uh, the work from both sides. And the low heat is equal to the high heat minus the work, or 12,000 joules minus 5,000 joules of work that we did is 7,000 joules of lost energy, unfortunately. So we can calculate the efficiency of our engine by taking out by taking the amount of work that we did, 5,000 joules of useful work, and dividing by the amount of heat energy that we put in, the 12,000 joules. And when we do that, we get an efficiency of 0.42, or only 42%. Wow, we uh, spend a lot of energy to get out um, only a fraction of the useful work. Here's another example, a little, kind of a cute little toy with a little heat engine little, turning a little flywheel right here. Heat going in, driving a piston, spinning a flywheel. So, let's move on to uh, this next idea called entropy. Uh, as you saw in heat engines, you cannot get out more than you put in. Useful energy seems to always go into use, useless uh, thermal kinetic energy. That's the exhausted heat in our heat engine. And we can go back to our non-conservative uh, conservation of energy mathematical model. And uh, so this is showing you that that uh, exhausted uh, the, the potential energy of the flame, uh, the fuel for the flame, is turning into uh, translational kinetic energy that through the flywheel is rotational. Uh, the, the engine does heat up itself, so there's internal thermal kinetic energy. But then there's that Q low, that uh, heating that goes outside the system that's exhausted, and that is uh, this term that we were used to before. Well, so eventually all of the energy, even the rotating and translating energy, will go into heat as well. And so this is the idea that everything goes into molecular motion eventually and uh, gets dissipated into random molecular movement. And that's this idea of disorder uh, increasing in the system, and that's called entropy. We had a nice ordered potential energy of the um, fuel, and then uh, it went into uh, useful work for us, but then also into uh, unused random molecular motion. And in any system, the entropy always increases. The amount of disorder in a system always increases. For an example, if I pull somebody back on a swing and let them go, they will eventually slow down and stop. Well, what happened to all that energy? It went into random molecular movement. The entropy increased in the system, the amount of disorder increased. Here are some examples of increasing entropy. You clean your room and it'll get messy again soon. Build a sand castle, it will be washed and blown away. You can jot down the rest of these. They're all good examples of increasing disorder and decreasing organized energy. Order takes energy. Again, if you want to swing a child, you're going to have to keep pushing. You can't just pull back and release once. Every once in a while, you have to do more work. You have to put energy into the system to keep it orderly. Unfortunately, 
disorder happens naturally and entropy always increases. So, does this mean that all of the energy in the universe will turn into useless thermal kinetic energy eventually? Yes, but the energy won't run out for a long time. We get some of our energy from sources here on Earth. As we fight entropy, those sources will eventually run out. However, the sun is our main source of energy and it's estimated to last another 5 billion years. However, uh, planetary studies suggest that potentially Venus and other planets might run into each other and even collide with the sun and cause some other kind of cat catastrophic event. But uh, that won't happen, they estimate, for another 40 million years. So I think we're good to go. And Scratch's parting thought... And good luck on your quest for continuous improvement.